St. Gabriel's Ultrasound Center was not what I expected. The building was in a small compound in Yimetu, and there was a sign that pointed visitors in the direction of the top floor. The front wall was decorated with large stones cemented together, so it looked as if the building had been sculpted from a mountain of granite. From the gate, I saw women sitting on benches, their backs leaning heavily against the iron railings that enclosed the balcony. There was a chemist on the ground floor, where a garage should have been, but no windows shed light on the boxes of tablets bundled together on the shelves. It looked dark and dingy. A large yellow fridge held the garage door open. A young woman sitting outside on a bar stool called to me. Auntie, cool yourself down with a bag of cold, pure water. I ignored her. I wasn't thirsty. I'd hailed a taxi on Songo Road and instructed the driver to take me directly to my destination. The taxi driver peered at me through his rearview mirror, probably wondering why an ordinary-looking woman was wasting money on such an extravagance. As if to pay me back, he tried to overcharge me. 200 naira, he said, fiddling with some wires behind his steering wheel. 50, I asserted. Madame, pay a hundred. <laughs> Each passenger pays 20 naira from where I picked you up, and this car carries five passengers. I will give you 80. You are only supposed to carry four. Madame, you must help us poor taxi drivers. If we don't carry five, how will we feed our children? By not trying to swindle your passengers, I counted four 20 naira notes and placed them in his open palm. The man looked at the money. He contemplated haggling some more, but relented when he saw that I had folded my arms and cocked my head to one side. The stairs were steep and cumbersomely coiled. I reached the top to find an array of women, different heights, different widths, different stages of pregnancy, all of them huffing and puffing, most of them emptying small plastic bags of water into their mouths. They all looked as if they were set to leak from every orifice and flood the faded rubber tiles. I saw inside the waiting room through a wall of windows. Every space on every bench was taken. Beside a wooden counter, a door opened into a corridor. I looked down the passage. There were two doors on either side. Three were signposted with doctors' names. One was boldly labelled toilet. There was a small queue at each door, but no less than nine women clenched their thighs outside the lavatory. A nurse in a gleaming white dress assessed me as I approached the counter. She was short and heavy-hipped, but her ebony skin glowed. Her teeth were white with a sizable gap separating the two front incisors. I spotted the gap as soon as she spoke. My passion for blemishes had not left me. She took down my name and deftly stapled my request forms to the ultrasound center letterhead. You have to sit down and wait. Drink some water. It makes it easier for the doctor to see everything he needs to see. We recommend three bags. How long do you think I'll be waiting for? It is impossible to say, but if you leave, you will lose your place. You are number 78. Number 23 just stepped in now. Have a seat and wait like everyone else. I scowled and walked out onto the balcony without making eye contact with anyone. Did I say I was different from everyone else? I reflected on her abruptness as I picked my way down the stairs. I snubbed the chemist again. I wanted a bottle of water. The thought of scrunching bags of dubious water down my throat held little appeal. As I walked out of the gate, a policeman in his faded black uniform caught my eye. He stood across the road from me and was filling his tank with a small can of petrol. There were more policemen sitting on a bench under a trimmed almond tree. Squatting before them was a young girl measuring boiled groundnuts into old milk tins and emptying them into newspapers that had been folded into neat triangles. The policemen were in a jolly mood. They kept falling forwards in fits of laughter. I walked past a fragrant roasted plantain stall. A woman in a lacy low-cut blouse fanned the coal with a sheet of cardboard. The smoke made my eyes water, so I quickly crossed the driveway of a mechanic's workshop and stopped. From outside, I could see that it was brightly lit by fluorescent bulbs. The windows were closed too, which meant it had air conditioning. Back at the ultrasound center, I sat on the hard wooden pew and shifted my weight from buttock to buttock. I didn't seem to have as much cushioning as the other women. I reasoned that pregnancy must be kind to the backside. I glanced at the women's fattened nostrils and marveled at the immodesty with which they displayed their swollen ankles. As they waddled out of the dark corridor, I tried to guess who might be carrying twins, triplets, a boy, a girl, or a stillborn child. After all, some of the women left with bloodshot eyes and bits of tissue stuck to their faces. Why else would they be so bereft? It was a tedious game, but it helped to pass the time. The women probably thought I was in my first trimester. The thought awakened butterflies in my belly not the sorrow I anticipated. My eyes caught a sign on the wall. If you have another baby girl, blame daddy. I was just thinking of Iatope and her desire to give birth to a son when it registered that my number had been called.
That's me, I said, standing up hurriedly. My forms fell from my lap. Go to room three and wait until you are invited. The nurse frowned and eyed the forms as I retrieved them from the floor, as if to be certain that I picked off every single one. The doctor was pleasant looking. His chin jutted out slightly, giving his face a glum appearance. The armpits of his tie-dye shirt were darkened from perspiration, even though cool air was blowing from a noisy air conditioning unit hitched into a rectangular hole in the wall. His eyes did not leave the scan monitor. Your forms, please, he said, motioning at me. I handed them over to a nurse, holding out her hand. The doctor's fingers were long, and his nails were bitten into the cuticles. He flashed me a reassuring smile as he splattered a globule of gel onto my belly. He called out numbers and letters to the nurse. She repeated everything he said and filled out the blank spaces on the forms. Turn on to your left side, please, the doctor requested. He held out his arm so I could grasp it to change position. He pressed my belly with three fingers. It was mildly uncomfortable, but I did not let out a sound. When the examination was complete, he told me to change in the adjoining room, all the time sealing his findings away in an envelope. I wanted to ask questions, but decided not to. Whatever the news was, it was best to hear it at once. I took the envelope and went in search of a diagnostic laboratory. Ten years ago, I stood beneath that same Agbalumo tree, not far from here. I was alive then. I was head girl of my secondary school, head of the school literary and debating society. I knew I was the daughter every parent wanted. I could tell from the way they asked my opinion of their children's conduct in school. Those were the days when I was Mama's beloved child. Mama said my sister Lara was so lazy that she'd need a maid to lift food into her mouth. I was the good daughter. That day, it rained so hard that birds' nests fell from the trees. It was impossible to stand by the roadside without being edged downstream by the currents. There was muddy water everywhere, swishing around people's feet and sweeping along scrunched up newspapers and plastic water bags. The wind had turned my umbrella inside out and my clothes were wet to my skin. As was the case when it rained hard, the taxis didn't respond to whistling or hisses. They preferred to preserve their carburettors rather than brave waterlogged potholes. I'd never come home late from singing practice before, and I knew my mother would soon start worrying. I hadn't even done my chores. I kept looking at my watch in the hope that the second hand would tick a little slower. I reassured myself that at least Awolowo Road was safe, a place where rich, decent people lived. I was looking at the palm trees, peeping over the fences, crowned with shards of broken glass, when a Mercedes screeched to a halt, reversed, and parked about a yard away from me. Hoping it would be one of my school friends, I ran to the car and poked my head through the window. The face I saw was unfamiliar, so I apologized and took two steps back. My mother had warned me about kidnappers. You're going to get swept away by the rain, came a soft voice from the driver's seat. Where are you going? I took another step back and looked in the direction of the passing cars. Maybe he'd drive on if I looked away. Are you waiting for someone? Look, you're the only person standing here in the rain. If you're waiting for a taxi, I could give you a ride further down. There are lots of them at Oshuntokun Junction. I moved a little closer. I glanced at the car and then at him. He looked respectable, not like the thugs my mother had described. I could smell his cologne. It was like freshly cut grass. His face was handsome and his fingernails were filed to perfection. He was wearing a polo shirt with a crocodile on the left breast. His jeans were clean. My mother has told me not to accept rides from people I don't know, I said as I reached out to the door handle. I'm not a stranger anymore, am I? My name is Thomas, and I'd say we've already been having a pleasant conversation, he grinned. When we got to the roundabout, he took a sharp right instead of taking the second exit. Sir, you said Oshuntokun. Are you in a hurry? I just want to make a quick phone call to my sister in the US. She's in hospital. I live just round the corner. As soon as I'm done, I'll run you down to Oshuntokun. I may even be able to take you home. Where do you live? I live in Agbowo. The problem is that my mother will be worried. He sniggered. Big girl like you, mentioning your mother in every sentence. You sound like a baby. Are you a baby? How old are you? I'm 15. I'm not a baby. I held my head high. He turned round and looked at my face. Then his eyes dropped to my breasts. You don't look 15. Are you really? Yes. What kind of music do you like? Anything. Anything? Well, this will be to your taste then. It's perfect for people who like anything. He took out a Wasu Ainde CD and inserted it into the car stereo, which swallowed it and belched a familiar drumbeat. He turned up the air conditioner. I felt its coolness blow up my bare arms and through my damp blouse. 
It smelt like rain hitting hot pavements. It was a comforting smell. I sat back and relaxed against the velvety seat. He turned into Lower Awolowa Road and sped down a close. He jumped out to open the gate, thrusting the key through a makeshift hole in the thick iron. After he drove in, he locked the gate behind us. I won't be a minute, he said, and ran indoors, shutting the car door. I looked around me. There'd been a power cut, so it was dark. The deafening blare of generators came from the houses on either side. From the outdoor lamps in the house next door, I could make out blood-red hibiscus. Rows of potted partridge pea plants lined the walls. The man suddenly rushed out of the house with an umbrella. He was now wearing a pair of khaki shorts. I want to uh, put the generator on. I can't see a thing inside. It's one of those cordless phones and I don't know where it is. Why don't you get down and help me look for it so we can be on our way? No, I I'd rather wait in the car. Thank you. But you'll get bitten by mosquitoes. There's more music inside. I huffed and left my bag in the car to show that I had no intention of staying long. I was inquisitive. I'd never been driven in a Mercedes before. My father owned an ancient Peugeot 504 and my mother had hopped on and off buses for as long as I'd been old enough to notice. Part of me wanted to see how this man lived. I wanted to see the inside of his house, see the kind of chairs he sat on. I wanted to know if he had the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting my friends at school often described. I wanted to smell wealth and glimpse the lifestyle I aspired to, the luxury I would live in when I was older and rich. Soon after his generator started roaring, he appeared and I followed him into his kitchen. He held the door open for me and locked it behind us. Security, he reassured me. The kitchen was covered in white tiles. A large chest freezer hummed in the corner. The spotless gas cooker had six burners. I'd never seen one like it. The work surface was tiled, all white, except for a few drops of what looked like blackcurrant juice. His sitting room walls were light green. Cream leather armchairs were arranged around a square rug that had acacia trees around the edges. There were oxblood cushions everywhere. Just wait here while I search the bedroom. He knew I was taking everything in. It was probably obvious from my clothes that I was unfamiliar with this sort of bounty. I sat on a sofa and looked ahead at the big screen television. I got up first to touch it and then to switch it on. I couldn't tell what button to press, so I squatted to look at the diagrams. I didn't hear him creep up behind me. So, how about a little fun before you go? He had taken his shirt off, and there was a mass of curly hair petering out as it reached his boxer shorts. I covered my eyes. I perceived something uncompromising in his tone. It unsettled me, and my heart began to race. Come on, don't waste time. Isn't this what you came for? You think I don't know your type? You just came to fuck, didn't you? You want to be fucked. No, sir. I just want to go home. I don't want anything else, sir, I whimpered. His hand shot upwards and his fist connected with my cheekbone. I staggered. The wooden stool behind me stopped me from falling to the ground. I regained balance and stood up straight. I covered my face with my hands and burst into tears. Please, sir, have mercy on me. I don't want anything else. I just want to go home, I cried. But I knew no one could hear me. I could barely hear myself over the din of the generators. He moved closer to me, and with great accuracy, he struck both my shoulders with his knuckles. My arms fell limp to my sides, and I dropped to my knees from the pain. He grabbed a handful of my hair, dragged me into his bedroom, and threw me on the bed. He climbed on top of me, but I clamped my legs together and pleaded for him to stop. My resistance annoyed him, and he pulled a pillow over my face. I was sure I was going to die because I couldn't breathe. I could hear my heartbeat slowing. My arms were so weak that I couldn't even scratch him. When he finally lifted the pillow off my face and laid it beside me on the bed, I barely had the strength to inhale. I was paralyzed. If you don't want to die, lie still with your legs apart, he barked. I saw the glint of desperation in his eyes. Was this the man who had helped me out of the rain? Where had this monster come from? Those were my last thoughts before I blacked out. There was a splash of icy water on my face, and for a moment, I thought I was back by the roadside. Then I felt pain deep in my groin. There was wetness between my thighs. I burst into tears. What had he done to me? Don't exaggerate. It's not that bad. Go to the bathroom and clean yourself up. It's getting late, and you should be home. His voice was softer again. I summoned all my strength and stumbled through the open door. The first thing I saw was my reflection in the mirror above the sink. I touched my face, thankful that the swelling was hardly noticeable. What I had hoped to save for my husband had been wrenched from me, 
and all I had to show for it was an excruciating ache and disheveled hair. When I rested my arms on my breasts to button up my blouse, I felt how tender they were. I took a peek and found fading teeth marks all over them. The toilet roll sat on top of a pile of magazines. The cardboard cylinder revealed a naked woman's open legs. I wet the tissue and wiped off the streaks of blood on my thighs. I noticed that my skirts were still bunched together at my waist, so I freed the hem and ironed it down with wet palms. The man was dancing in his seat and singing along to the music in between cigarette puffs. It had stopped raining. He raced down the Oyo Road towards Agbawu. Throughout the journey, I stared out of my window, trying to reconcile the person I was now with the girl who stood cold and wet beneath the Agbalumo tree. I caught my face in the winged mirror. Who are you? I asked myself. You should be smiling, he said, tapping his fingertips on the steering wheel. You can drop me off right here. I will walk home. We were in front of the university gates, three streets from our bungalow. Before facing my family, I wanted a little time to compose myself. I mean it. You should be happy. You're a woman now. You should be thanking me. He parked very close to the curb. Thank you, I spluttered as I climbed out of the front seat. I didn't know what else to say. I didn't look back at him. I did not want to remember his face, his eyes, his jaw. I wanted to forget him. I walked as briskly as I could and disappeared into the throng of plantain sellers. At the lab, the sight of my blood coloring the syringe brought back memories of the operating room. It had been more of a hut, really. Planks knocked together, covered with corrugated iron sheets. There was no ceiling, so the sun had an unfair advantage. Shegun was bent over me, clutching my hand. He was nervous. His hand kept reaching inside his breast pocket for a handkerchief that wasn't there. You know it's best to do it here, don't you? Shegun blustered, praying he was answering the questions my eyes were asking. The risk of being seen is too high anywhere else. God forbid that one of my father's friends should recognize me. What would I say I was doing in a hospital with a woman? This place is fine, I said. I didn't want him to think that I wasn't grateful. I don't know what I would have done if he hadn't had the good sense to bring me here. It didn't matter that he was sleeping with me and therefore horrified by the thoughts that the child might be his. Things had happened quickly between us. He said he wanted me and I gave myself to him. The affection he showed me was everything. Of course, this place is fine. <laughs> I have been doing this for 25 years. If the women of Aikara are satisfied with my services, you should also set your mind at rest. The midwife had traipsed in wearing an oversized lab coat. She had a metal pan in one hand and a stainless steel instrument in the other. Her gloves had droplets of blood on them and her little finger peeped through the rubber. Mister, you will have to leave now. Wait outside, please. Shegun brushed my arm as he walked away until our fingertips were the only parts of our bodies touching. The anesthetic was swift. I slept with Shegun's face before my eyes. I dreamt I was on a roller coaster, which was strange because I'd never even seen one before, except on TV. A stranger sat to my right with a noose around his neck. To my left, a man sat with a pillowcase over his head. It was as if we were bound together by fate, because as our carriage soared, sank, dipped and climbed, we were gripped by the same fear, and all of us pleaded to be let off. The man on my right suddenly began to bang his head against the metal guard that held us in place, while the one on my left ground his teeth relentlessly. I made to slap sense into both of them, but iron bars appeared from nowhere and pinned my arms to my sides. I couldn't move any of my limbs. Please let me off. I promise to be strong, I screamed. I didn't know why I was uttering those words. They were meaningless to me. I never came off the roller coaster. Instead, I opened my eyes to find Shegun holding me down with all his body weight, his chest on top of mine. From the corner of my eye, I could see the midwife wiping down a steel beak-like instrument with cotton wool and bloodied water. Tears ran down my face and into my ears. My heart raced and I was unbearably thirsty. When I tried to sit up, I expected my arms to be buckled to the examining table, but they were as they always were, free. There were drops of diluted blood everywhere. The nurse had stuffed a clump of cotton wool into my pants. It looked like white pubic hair. Shegu helped me into the back of the Honda his father had bought for him for his 19th birthday. He propped my head up with the packet of sanitary towels we'd bought on our way to the nurse. Stay down so no one sees you. I will drive to a quiet spot so you can rest for about an hour. There isn't much time. Your mother will soon be back from work. Remember, I can only drop you at the junction. You will have to walk home by yourself. 
the diagnostic lab, the nurse deposited my blood into the labelled vials. Tears made the back of my eyes ache, but I was determined to shed them in the safety of my bedroom. They escaped as soon as the sun warmed the top of my head. How could I hold it together when my destiny hung before me, like the proverbial mangoes? Hear me, the king pronounced. The flesh of these big yellow mangoes gives eternal life. But beware, the tree has roots of poison. Only the strong and the brave can eat the mangoes and live. But could anyone boast of strength and bravery before they'd eaten the mangoes and lived? Iafemi. Your father and your mother are gone. The man whose lips mouthed these words was my uncle, my father's only sibling. His eyes were bloodshot and swollen. He had lived with us for as long as I could remember. When my father went into the deep forest to hunt bushmeat, it was he who watched over me and my mother. My mother didn't need watching over. Whenever my father stepped out of the house, she sat on the porch and wove baskets until he returned. Many said their dying together was God's mercy. Gone where? I asked. My parents didn't go anywhere without telling me. My tears demanded an answer. They are dead. My uncle shook me by the shoulders, as if to ensure that the words he had spoken sank into my mind. I fought off his fingers. I leapt into the air, aiming for the wall with my forehead. It took three grown men to hold me down. Somebody must have put a curse on them. People in our village didn't like to see others doing well. Why else would a log slip from a lorry and crush them on a road they travelled every day? This was the question I asked the perplexed mourners who came to pay their respects. My parents were good people, hard workers. Our house was built from concrete blocks. My father always said we deserve to live like royalty. They were buried on the day they died, the Muslim way. I was their only child, but I was not allowed to see them. The men did their best to hide their corpses from me, but I saw red streaks on the white cloths they were bound with. Blood leaked from their broken heads as they were lowered into the ground. Guy, what a terrible appetite this ground we tread has. It eats the bones of good and bad alike. We have found work for you in Ibadan. My uncle did not have the courage to say this to my face, so instead he sent the ugly witch he was courting. My mother despised her. She said the woman had the disease of the eye. Everything she saw, she wanted. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay in Okegbo, where my parents are buried. This is my home. Wipe your eyes, she said, passing me a rag. It has been a month since your parents died. This is not your home and it will never be. A girl cannot inherit her father's house because it is everyone's prayer that she will marry and make her husband's home her own. This house and everything in it now belongs to your uncle. That is the way things are. Everything belongs to my uncle? It was as if the witch had rammed a fist through my chest. If I had had a knife at that moment, believe me, I would have sliced her belly wide open. Yes, your uncle. What will you do with this house anyway? You cannot live here alone. Even your grandmother has said it is better for you to go. She was lying. I'd seen my father's mother on her way to the market. She was half blind. From the way she was walking, gingerly greeting passers-by, it was obvious she hadn't been told of her son's death. It would have killed her, and another funeral so soon would have been costly. So you and my uncle will live here and use all my father's belongings? My uncle had won my father's hat to the burial. Go and pack. The people you will work for are coming to collect you this evening. I cannot believe you would do this when you know how much my father wanted me to go to school. He wanted me to be educated. Baba, can you hear me? What kind of misfortune is this that has befallen me? I placed my hands on my head and invoked my father's spirit. Listen to the words coming from your mouth. Your parents have spoilt you. Maggots crawl beneath your skin. Your uncle has found you a household where they have promised to send you to school if you behave. Yet, all you can talk about is the misfortune that has befallen you. Many people who are older than you have not tasted the sweet life you have enjoyed since birth. Your parents should be ashamed. The ugly witch shook her head. I do not know when and how my teeth found her ear, but they refused to unclench, even as blood dripped from her lobe into my mouth. My uncle heard the wailing from where he was hiding and ran to her rescue. The hand pestle my uncle used to knock my mouth open broke one of my front teeth. I didn't care. What was half a tooth to half an ear? 
she would think twice before speaking ill of my parents again. When the woman who came to collect me arrived, they eagerly told her that I was an untamed animal. They told her to watch me, lest my madness drive me to bite the bark of neighborhood trees. There aren't many trees where we live, the woman said, and if there were, she would be too busy sweeping the leaves under them. As they drove me away, I glared at my uncle through the rear window and licked my lips. He should have known that I would return one day, but that is the problem with evildoers. They forget that the world turns, like the people in it. I was indeed pampered, but I was not spoilt. And although my mother washed all my clothes for me, there were no compromises when it came to cooking. She cracked my head with the wooden spoon if my amala was either too soft or too dense. With no mama to wash my clothes, I soon learned how soda bites the finger and hardens the palm. As soon as we got to Ibadan, the woman snatched my bag, pressed two check dresses into my hands, and told me I was to call her grandma. She said only her children called her mommy, and I was too lowly to emulate them. Here, she said, the house girls wear uniforms. She showed me a tiny space under the stairs and pointed to a mat that was wedged beneath three wooden planks. This is where you will sleep. Let me warn you. I don't want to see any signs that someone slept here when I come downstairs in the morning. I will burn anything that is out of place. If that means you'll walk around naked, then so be it. I served the Adeigbe family for 15 years. I served grandma and her husband. I served their children and then their children's children. From the day I got there, I was a house girl, and my status did not change. They pillaged the most fruitful years of my life, all the time treating me as if they'd found me in a pit latrine. Grandma slapped me if a drop of oil fell from the ladle to the cooker. If I didn't answer the first time she yelled my name, she shaved every strand of hair on my head. If I ever overslept, she would cut me all over with a blade and rub chili powder into the wounds. Once, when she saw me speaking to the gateman, she stripped me naked, rubbed chili between my thighs, and locked me out of the house for a whole day. She did not even remember that I was 18 years old with a chest full of breasts and thighs full of hair. All I could do was weep with shame. It was Tunde, Grandma's only son, who first climbed between my legs. I was not allowed to retire for the night until everyone who lived in the household was within its walls, so I would doze on the stairs while I waited. On this particular night, he came in drunk as usual. He said he'd had a bad night and I should have mercy and let him fuck me. I didn't scream like grandma's daughters did when they brought men home on hot afternoons. I lay down quietly and hid the pain beneath my skin. When he had finished, he embraced me and told me my body was worth paying for. I don't know what you're doing here, he said as he washed himself in the kitchen sink. He emptied a handful of detergent onto his palm and scrubbed his penis with his fingertips. Then he patted his pubic hair with a dishcloth. You're not going to serve my family for the rest of your life, are you? I remember this conversation because I was 21 years old at the time, yet it had never occurred to me that I could leave. Although the prospect of freedom excited me, the idea of escaping made my heart pound. For many days, I thought about Tunde's words. Then, in my childishness, I decided to give Grandma a chance to redeem herself. I reminded her that I would like to go to school one day. She cursed me for my ingratitude and took away my mat for three days. The floor was so cold that I never mentioned it again. Although Tunde's words often returned to my mind, I tried to forget the possibility of a future, a marriage, a family, or a home of my own. I became convinced that laundering other people's clothes, cooking three separate dishes every mealtime, and comforting babies that weren't mine was my lot in life. I was a fool to think Grandma would be interested in giving me the opportunity to better myself. It wasn't until the day Grandma sent me to the market to buy two tins of sweet corn that the impulse to flee returned. Grandma had had me chopping, roasting, and frying since 3 a.m. that morning. It was one of her grandson's birthdays, and birthdays were a grand affair. I suffered from fatigue after every one. My limbs would ache and my head would boil for days. There were times when it took me a week to recover. I never let grandma know this. If she saw me resting, she would punish me. It was surprising that she even allowed me to go to the market by myself because she preferred to do all her own grocery shopping. I normally walked two steps behind her and struggled with the carrier bags. And although it was her memory that had failed her the day before, she'd stupidly ticked sweet corn off her shopping list even though she hadn't bought it. I was the one who was sent into the hot sun. She didn't even permit her driver to take me. She said such luxuries would make me aspire to a status that was beyond me. 
I was on the verge of collapse when I got to the market. The top of my head was baking and I could feel the warm sand through the holes in my flip-flops. Anyway, there I was, propped up by one of the walls at Budija Market, when a man asked me if I knew Jesus. From the little time I'd spent in primary school when my parents were alive, I knew that Jesus belonged to the Christians. Since I wasn't allowed to go to church with grandma and her family, he was indeed a stranger, so I answered, no. The man shook his head, looked up to the skies and then at me. I was born a Muslim. I hadn't asked for his sympathy. Then let me buy you a Coke and tell you what happens to those who die without confessing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He had a Bible wedged in his armpit. His shirt was faded and his trousers were at least two inches short. He himself looked like he could do with Jesus' blessings. So I was both suspicious of his eagerness to save me and moved by his generosity. I drank my first full bottle of Coke in 14 years and it bubbled in my stomach. Its sweetness spread to my feet and my fingertips. The preacher spoke of love and all its virtues, but I just watched his mouth twitching from side to side. Perhaps he sensed that this idea of universal love was ridiculous to me. Or maybe I just wasn't responding to his words the way he'd hoped because his tone suddenly changed. It became firm and no nonsense. He warned that I would go to hell if heaven rejected me. But why would God reject me when I haven't done anything wrong? I thought perhaps I had fallen for the charms of a lunatic. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he said. But what about the people who sin every day? What about the rich who take and destroy? I was curious to see if his God would be partial to grandma because she was wealthy. Hellfire! Are you sure of this? Sister, all sinners will burn. His eyes flared on the word burn. His intention was to put the fear of God in me, but instead, the thought of grandma burning excited me. In my mind's eye, I saw images of hell, flames, melting faces, singed limbs. When he asked me to repeat the sinner's prayer after him, the sound of grandma's wailing and gnashing of teeth drowned his voice. I imagined my uncle and his woman sizzling in a bonfire of my father's possessions. That was a particularly lifting thought. Congratulations, he shouted. You are now born again. Now you too must spread the gospel of good news. For saving another soul, God has just added another room to my heavenly mansion. He drew a map of his church on the back of a tract and handed it to me. Thank you, I said as I walked away. I was glad he got something out of it too and tucked the paper into my bra. From that day, I prayed early every morning and late into the night. I created an altar beneath the stairs and laid the map of New Beginnings Church on it. A Jehovah's Witness booklet with images of heaven on the front cover sat next to it. Whenever Grandma slapped me for being absent-minded, it was comforting to remember that I would be welcomed into the new Eden while she was banished from the glorious gates and condemned to hell. Praise God. About two months after I received Jesus, Grandma scorched me with the iron because I burnt a hole in one of her silk blouses. As I spread a film of Vaseline over the naked flesh, I decided that it was simply not enough to edify myself with thoughts of her body crackling in hell. Something more drastic needed to be done. For hours every night I would chant, God, send Grandma and her family to hell, but spare Tunde her son. Tunde was still slipping money between the folds in my mat. I wasn't sure if he was paying me for the sex we now had frequently, or if he was just petrified that I would confess our trysts to his mother. Who had time for telling tales when there was so much praying to be done? After seven days of fervent prayers, Grandma slipped in the bathtub and broke her leg. My initial joy was shattered when I realized that she would use her immobility to find me more work. She became an invalid. I had to bathe her and towel her dry as well as everything else. Was Jesus punishing me or was he pushing me to use the reins he'd handed me? I chose the latter and started stirring urine and then a few drops of toilet water into grandma's cup. It wasn't long before she was admitted to hospital for terrible diarrhea. How weak are the stomachs of the wicked? All the time I lived there, I was only allowed to drink tap water. Grandma said it was wasteful for me to drink from the family supply that I boiled and filtered every morning. Since the day my uncle sold me, this was the first time grandma hadn't been able to send me on errands. I soon began to believe that I too had dropped from between a woman's legs. While her husband and children spent their days by her side in a private hospital, 
I wandered beyond our fence. There was a new house being built across the road, and that is where I met Baba Segi. He was supplying the plumbing materials, and he looked powerful, yet kind in his yellow safety helmet. I offered him Grandma's precious boiled water. He accepted it and thanked me. The next day, he brought me a basket of oranges. It was Taju who delivered them. I didn't waste time in telling Taju I was looking for a man to marry me. I was desperate. I didn't want Grandma to come back and find me there. <laughs> Baba Segi is the one who has enough money to marry many women, Taju advised. The one I have complains every day. Then make him marry me. Convince him and put me in your debt forever. I have no relatives, so there is no one for him to pay homage to. Did you drop from the sky? Even farther up than the sky. Wait here and I will bring you something. I divided the money I had stolen over the years into two and forced one half into Taju's hand. I don't know what he told Babasegi, but he did his job well. Less than a week later, Taju came alone in the pickup and parked across the road. It was mid-morning and the house was empty, so I had time to pack everything I wanted. Before I drove away with him, I rubbed shit into every pillow in the house, except for Tunde's. My journey with him hadn't ended yet. The first thing that struck me about Babasegi's house was the soiled curtains. The layer of dust on them was so thick that Grandma would have sliced the veins in my neck if she ever came home to find hers looking like that. Except her imported foil curtains wouldn't have been so vile anyway. The house girl would have washed them as soon as she felt the pinch of the red harmattan winds. The walls of Baba Segi's house were stained too. Everything was grubby, but the wives were worst of all. The aging toad and the shameless goat. One ruled the pond, the other played with its shadow all day. And how they stank. If I'd really wanted to punish them, I would have turned round and returned to Grandma's house immediately. But I decided to show mercy, especially after Babaseki showed me my room. I was 23, yet I'd never had my own room before. I'd slept between my parents until the day they died. I looked at the double bed and tested the softness of the mattress with both palms. I would have been a fool not to lie on it, even if it was for just one night. I now know why rich people sleep longer than paupers. When I woke up the next morning, I felt like I was suspended in mid-air. It was as if I had reached my heaven. Not even God himself could have made me leave Baba Segi's house after that. The next morning, Iyatokwe brought breakfast into my room. Her fingers touched the face of the plate as she placed it on the bedside table. There was no way I could eat it, so for two days, all I did was sleep and wake, wake and sleep, harboring unbearable hunger pangs. On the third day, I stood up from my slumber, knowing I'd die if I didn't eat. I found the kitchen and scrubbed every inch of it. The wives stepped around me in hushed curiosity. I finished at eight o'clock in the evening. Then I sat on the floor and finished a plate of yam. I cleaned and cooked the yam myself. That night, Baba Segi came to me. He sat on my bed and grabbed my breasts. I thought it was all quite amusing until he jumped between my legs and tried to force his penis into me. I am still wearing my pants, I told him. He wasn't like Tunde at all. There was no sucking, no licking. No nuzzling, no moistening. Baba Segi was heavy. Everything about him was clumsy and awkward. He heaved and hold, poured his water into me and collapsed onto my breasts. Tunde never did that. He always shook his water onto my belly. I looked forward to the day our paths would cross again at a junction. I knew I would find Tunde when the time was right. One day, that fat frog, Iyasegi, asked if I'd noticed that Iyatope had left all the house cleaning to me. The truth was that I didn't want to share the washing and cleaning with Iyatope. Sometimes I had to clench my fists to resist the urge to drag her to the backyard, brush her yellowing teeth, wipe her nose, and scrub her from top to bottom. When I asked Iyasegi what she wanted me to do with the information she had given me, she lifted both palms and insisted she was only telling me because she had taken a liking to me. Thank you, I said, looking her straight in the eye. Let me tell you now, I don't like people who think they can outsmart me. Grandma used to throw skirts into the laundry basket with money in the pockets, hoping I'd steal it so she could accuse me. I wasn't that stupid. Then she'd leave her jewelry box open and leave one ring in it. One. As if I didn't know she stored the rest of her jewelry in a vanity case in the wardrobe. The day I left their house, I took complete sets with me. I took a heavy cross too. If I was going to be a Christian, I would need a crucifix. The most stupid thing was what Grandma did about the pants though. She'd creep up behind me and ask me to lift my skirt to check which underwear I was wearing. She did this every time her daughters reported that their pants were missing. Why would I wear stolen pants? 
They were buried in the big sack of rice in the pantry. I hate it when people think they can outsmart me. The frog was relentless. She taught me tricks that helped me get the better of the goat. Do this for Baba Segi, she'd say. It will make him love you more. More than he loves you? I'd ask. Then she'd make that sound in her throat. Just like a frog. Although the idea of becoming the wife who could get anything she wanted from Baba Segi was attractive to me, the prize was less so. Baba Segi was like a flatulent pig. Grandma would have scolded him. She would have rubbed chili powder around his anus. Remember I said there was a road ahead for me and Tunde? Well, one day, I trailed him from Grandma's house to his workplace. When he saw me running towards him, he burst into laughter. He laughed until tears fell from his eyes. Bravo, he kept shouting. He says many strange things that I don't understand. He took me to a hotel not far from his office and said renting a room for two hours in the afternoon was called short time. It was good to have him back between my thighs, especially after two nights with Baba Segi, whose penis was so big that two men could share it and still be well endowed. Where he used his bam, bam, bam like a hammer, Tunde used his like a forefinger. He bent and turned until it stroked all the right places. During one of our frequent short time sessions, I told Tunde that I was married to Baba Segi. He didn't seem surprised at all. He just smiled. It can only make our time sweeter, he said. One night, when Baba Segi was busy pummeling Iyatope, Iyasegi came to my room and told me how children were born in Baba Segi's household. She said it as if the solution wasn't out of choice, but necessity. When she left my room, I smiled to myself. I was already pregnant. Six months later, Baba Segi and I brought Femi home from hospital. He is very big for a child born three months early, his first wife sneered. I told her the ways of God were mysterious and snatched my newborn son from her arms. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate Baba Segi. On the contrary, I have several reasons to be thankful to him. He gave me a place of refuge when the wicked of the world were ready to swallow me whole. You see, when the world owes you as much as it owes me, you need a base from which you can call in your debts. In return for his kindness, I have worked tirelessly to make him happy. I cook his favorite meals the way grandma taught me. The people in this household are easy to please. Cook them a hearty meal and they worship you. In the years I have lived in Babasegi's house, I have never forgotten the evil my uncle did to me. Every day the children come home from school and talk about science and maths. My head is flooded with anger. They use words like biology and geometry. Words I don't understand. Words I would have understood if my uncle had sent me to school. If he'd remembered the kindness with which my parents dealt with him, he would have seen to it that I became a greater person than I am today. I would have been rich and powerful, not a third wife in an illiterate man's home. My uncle deprived me of opportunities. And grandma too. Thieves, that's what they are. Filchers of fortune. I won't rest until they are punished. In the Bible, God said vengeance is mine. If God can delight in vengeance, how much more a poor soul like me who has been misused by the world? I must have revenge. Only then will I accept that there was a reason for all my suffering. Last week, I returned to my village. If in your mind you are asking what for, then it means you haven't been listening to my words. I returned to Okebu. Tunde took me. He said he wanted to help me make my dreams come true. I have often told him how I came to work for his mother for 15 years. My story moves him and he asks me if I mind that he sheds a tear or two. True enough, he sheds them and they are never more than the two agreed on. He says my life is a beautiful tragedy, though I don't know what that means. I waited in the barn they had built for their goats, two she-goats. <laughs> that was the extent of their livestock. The scent of the miserable creatures nearly killed me, so I kicked them until they limped off my land. My uncle was the first to come out through the back door. He had a large cloth around his waist. Staring into the clouds, he brushed his teeth with a chewing stick and spat intermittently. He was already using a walking stick. That is what wickedness does. You age before your time. His wife wasn't much better. When she came out to brush her teeth, she sat knees wide apart on a concrete block. Her eyes were open, yet she sounded like she was snoring. Glutton. Their children began to wake up and came out to greet their parents before commencing their morning chores. One of them came to the farm to feed the goats. When he couldn't find them, he scattered yam peel all over my yard. He looked like my father, tall and gangly, the back of his head pointed like the top half of an egg. His name was Malik. He flinched when he heard his father's voice thundering through the house. 
my uncle had developed a big voice in my absence. Seeing the young boy reminded me that I hadn't gone there to harm anyone, just to claim what was mine. What do you do when something that is yours is stolen? You destroy it. You take it apart so devastatingly that it can never be put together again. My fingers brushed the 50-liter can of paraffin. My palm itched to turn the lid, but I waited. The longer you wait for revenge, the sweeter it is. Before long, the children marched out of the house in red stripes on khaki. <laughs> so he let his own children go to school. The injustice. Tears came to my eyes, but I blinked them back. Soon, my uncle too slapped the road with his slippers, an old hoe hooked over his shoulder. No doubt, he was going to my farmland. My heart thumped with anticipation as I crept out of my hiding place. There was no real need to crouch and hide, as we still didn't have neighbors. My father said he built our house away from the village so we would be shielded from the world's envious eyes. Starting from the backyard, I poured paraffin along the walls. I poured some on the concrete bench my mother placed her baskets on. I poured some on the doormat we used to scrape mud from our feet. The paupers hadn't brought anything or changed anything. Everything was as my father left it. I sprinkled paraffin over all I could see. My uncle's wife didn't recognize me when she opened the door. Do you know the Bible says, touch not my anointed, I asked. At first, she looked at me with interest, but when she saw my eyes burning, she retreated into the house. We are Muslims in this household, she replied. I am telling you what the Bible says. Because you have done worse than touch, you have bruised God's anointed. I barged past her and locked us both in. I put the key in my bra and poured paraffin on the clothes in the wardrobes, the baskets of food. I emptied the can into the overworn shoes stacked in a corner. I even upturned the paraffin stoves for good measure. It took a lot for me to swallow my laughter when she started banging on the door, shouting, Don't kill me! <laughs> Donkey me, more like. That would have been closer to the truth. How quickly fire eats. I ran and could see that the insides of the house were half consumed. Flames burst through the windows and the bungalow looked like a blackened shell. You thought I killed her, didn't you? I went seeking revenge, not death. I let her out of the front door, yelling and tearing at her scarf. She didn't know whether to summon her husband or brave the flames. I prayed that her most precious possessions were aflame, forever beyond reach, destroyed before her very eyes. A few villagers were running towards the furnace. They ran right past me, without even glancing in my direction. When I reached the end of the road, Tunde was waiting in his air-conditioned car. He was bent over the steering wheel laughing. <laughs> A bravo, he spluttered when he caught his breath. Tunde isn't like most men. He calls himself a hedonist. He says he lives for worldly pleasures. Who wouldn't like to live for pleasure? Only some were denied them for 15 years. Tunde's lips are constantly wrapped around a cigarette and he drinks beer until he is blind. He says he wants to die both under and inside a woman who is not his wife. He says the years with his mother have made me weak and that if I had any guts, I would live freely like he does. He is wrong. I am not weak at all. It's just that my journey with him isn't complete yet. And only when it is will I be truly free. But I can't tell him that. I am waiting for the day when my sons will be grown up. The day they can stand tall and walk proud. I don't treat my children the way the other wives treat theirs. I don't beat them or scold them. My babies won't suffer like their mother did. They will have pain-free lives. They will eat what they want and wash their hands when they want. The family know that the quickest way to see the red of my eyes is to let me come home and find one of my children weeping. They understand that my children aren't like the other children in Babasegi's household. They weren't sired by some riffraff. I made sure of that. Their father lives in a house with a garden and a gas cooker. Their father's mother is wealthy and respected. She doesn't have paupers as friends. She wears the best gold and the most elaborately embroidered lace. She would do everything to ensure her only son marries well and that his children are of good stock. Nothing makes me praise the Lord more than this. One day, I will walk into her house with her grandsons. I will look her in the eye and tell her that they are Tunde's children. Then I'll see what grandma will do. Things are different in this house now. For five years, Baba Segi loved me the most and showed it. He would pretend he had an evening fever so he wouldn't have to endure Iyasegi's bed. Then he would sneak into mine at night so he could be with me. He took me out to visit his friends. He liked the way I dressed, so I alone accompanied him to parties. He loved the way I cooked, the way I looked. Who wouldn't? 
I may be 30, but my limbs are quicker than a child's. My stomach bears no sign of labor. My breasts are full. I can't walk down the street without people wanting me. I couldn't even walk across the sitting room without Baba Segi salivating. But everything changed the day the monkey stepped into this house. Baba Segi found a monkey whose teeth had been cut on sorrow and he forgot about me. I cannot accept it. I will not accept it. How can anyone accept being pushed aside for a woman who stores blemished bulls? Let me tell you what makes me laugh the most. <laughs> the day we planted the juju in her room, she declared to the world she would give her husband a son. <laughs> what a fool. The biggest thing that will come out of her is a good hefty shit. The toad hates her, so she won't tell her the secret. The pygmy goat fears us, so she won't tell. And she won't hear anything from me. I want her gone. I want my place back, and I will get it. Three days after Iyasegi and I decided what we were going to do, she found me in the kitchen. At first, I thought she had just come to beg for food. It was Kole's fourth birthday, and I was preparing a feast. All the children were buzzing with anticipation and wondering what dish I would dazzle them with that year. Iyasegi tiptoed into the kitchen. What are you making, Iyafemi? The ghost has left the house, she whispered. Jollof rice and chicken. Baba Segi came to my room last night, but he didn't touch me. Before I could give him the ejakika I prepared for him, he was fast asleep, or so he wanted me to think. For a man who cannot sleep without snoring, I said, I didn't hear a sound from his mouth. That witch has cast a spell on him. If we are not careful, he won't sleep with us unless he asks her first. The gods forbid it. We forbid it. We will not let it happen. Look what I have brought you. Yasegi slipped me a small plastic bag bound several times over with a rubber band. <laughs> Yasegi, you have the heart of a lion and the wisdom of a tortoise. What better day to bring that monkey to justice? Keep your voice down. Yasegi peered out of the back door. Iyatope must not hear of this. Who knows where her weakness is leading her? Yes, it is between us. We must settle this matter and God will help us. Listen to me. Place Bolanle's portion outside her bedroom door, like we normally do when she doesn't join us. When she returns this evening, we will greet her as if all is well, so she does not suspect anything. How quickly does it work? Will we have cause to rejoice by tomorrow morning? Mr. Taju said the medicine man who sold it to him promised immediate results. He said it was collected from the fangs of a cobra. Taju lied that it was for easing life out of an ailing dog. When the poison turns her belly, Baba Segi will be forced to take her to her father's house. <laughs> you can count on me, Iyasegi. Evil doers should get what they deserve. The Bible says so. As soon as Iyasegi left the kitchen, I tore at the bundle impatiently. The Lord is going to use me to conquer my enemy. The mantle of justice has fallen on me. Ha! Ah, I am blessed. Homeward. Bolanli. I knew it was Kole's birthday when I woke up this morning, but rather than congratulate mother and son, I slipped out of the house and headed to the diagnostic clinic to collect the results of my blood tests. On the way there, I bought Kole a remote control car. Boxed and gift wrapped, the toy was heavier than I thought it would be, so I changed hands every time my wrist ached. I didn't want to return to Babasegi's house yet. I was perturbed by the rathead episode, and I felt an unmistakable homeward draw. I decided to go to my parents' house. If I wasn't so embarrassed, I would have visited my friends, if only to apologize. I'd hidden in my bedroom when Babasegi told them that their foolishness was not welcome in our home. Is it not obvious to you that Bolale has decided to choose the more virtuous path in life? You should both take her example, Babasegi told them. What woman wants to be known as a harlot? Yemisi gasped in disbelief. Before she left, she stopped by the mouth of the corridor and shouted, let Bolanle know that people are like water and the same waters that the streams divide meet again in the great ocean. Bolanle, you hear me? I wept with shame that afternoon. I also wanted to go home because rumors had a way of growing feet. I reasoned that it was probably best that I told my mother about the mysterious goings on in my home with my own mouth. The last thing I wanted was for her to blame the decline in my morals on my father's genes. I could practically hear her. She has become a medicine man's whore, like your sister. Or, she has developed a hunger for blood, like your mother did, before God clutched her to his bosom to give me rest. I bumped into Shegun's guard in Dube Market a few days before, 
and he'd mentioned that my mother complained of an unbearable throbbing in her temples. I hadn't been too bothered about this. Mama emptied sachets of alaboko into her mouth so often when I was a child that Lara and I thought that was what all mothers did. Anyway, today was a weekday, so unless Mama was taking the day off work, I was certain I'd have to leave a get well soon note. That way, I could avoid an update on the progress my university friends were making in their high-flying jobs as bankers, businesswomen, and lecturers. She wanted me to yearn for the life I could have had if I hadn't married Babasegi. Well, none of my friends had been horribly defiled, so it didn't bother me. Today, I didn't think I could stomach any lectures. I wasn't in the mood to have my failures dangled before my eyes. I was already ashamed of them, more so in the last few weeks. I reasoned that Mama would be glad we wouldn't have to speak to each other too. She never visited me at Babasegi's house, but every so often, a nameless visitor would drop off a branch of Awi, bait to get me back home, where I would wait for God to show me my true husband. At least she still remembered how much I loved Awi. When I reached the T-junction, everything seemed smaller, the road seemed narrower, and the tar was eroded by flooding. When Shegun's father was alive, he would tar it every January. Since his death, his wife had warned the tenants that if they couldn't contribute funds to arrest the deterioration, they'd better be content with parking their cars at the junction and forget her road was there. My parents lived in one of eight two-bedroom bungalows on a small plot of land. A tall fence separated the tenants from the landlords who occupied a sprawling multi-level structure surrounded by horticultural splendor. Every member of Shegun's family, sisters included, had their own little suites within the building. Only Shegun Suite had a door that opened onto the gardens. Everyone else used the magnificent awning that spooned people in and out of the main door. I walked through the gate to the bungalows and was immediately struck by the weeds that had grown around the section of fence that my parents' bungalow leaned against. Given that Mama cleaned religiously for fear of being associated with dirt, I was surprised to see bits of paper strewn around our doorway. Mama would not have let that pass when I was living at home. She would have called me into her room and made known her disgust that I was going the way of my father's shameless siblings. I could hear my heart thumping when I knocked on the door. I'd already started searching my bag for a notepad and pen with one hand when I heard a voice from within. I pushed the door open and followed the aroma of simmering okra to the kitchen. I stepped quietly through the sitting room, avoiding a pile of stale unwashed clothes and found Mama straddling a low stool. Bolale? Yes, Mama. She had her back to me. I didn't think my name would jump to her lips so readily. A mother never forgets her daughter's footsteps. She was sifting Elubo into a wide mouth basin. I sent for you as soon as it happened. As soon as what happened? I moved closer to her and knelt to embrace her. When she turned to face me, I flung handbag and birthday present in opposite directions. It looked as if one side of her face had first been doused with oil, then set alight. From her left brow to her chin, every feature drooped like melting plastic. Her left eye was weeping. Her left nostril was running. There was a line of saliva dribbling down the left corner of her mouth. Mama, I spluttered as tears gathered in my eyes. The doctors say it is Bell's palsy, or perhaps a very mild stroke. Calm down. Is this not my voice that you are hearing? I am not dead, at least not yet. Her voice was the same, but an octave higher. Her words seemed to spill from the corner of her mouth with a slight slur. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was suddenly dry. I feared she would hear me forcing a gulp. Mama let out a long breath, and droplets of spit flew from her lips. I sent your sister to you, but she said she would rather drown than stop at your husband's house. She must have seen the shock on my face. Your sister is not what she used to be. No, that is a lie. She is exactly what she used to be. She tried to stand, but her left thigh shuddered and shook. There is no room for me in her mind. It's just one man after the other. We do not know which one it is at any given time. She sighed. She too says she has found herself a husband. It may not have been an intended thrust, but it hurt all the same. Mama, when did this happen? Just six days ago, I was uh, slaving at work, as I have always done. A mother must continue to do her duty to her children. When suddenly I realized I couldn't hear what my colleagues were saying. I could see their mouths moving, but I couldn't hear their voices. The last thing I felt was the cold tiles I have been begging my boss to change. He could at least use some of the government money he embezzles to make his surroundings pleasing to the eye. His home must be just as dirty. Anyway, when I came to, I found myself in a bed at UCH. They said I should stay on, but I threatened to jump off the balcony 
if they did not let me return home. She looked around and shook her head. Just look how Lara has been living. The house looks like it has been taken over by harlots. You know how lazy she is. Well, I have gathered all the dirty clothes together for her to deal with. She thought I would die in hospital, but Eledumari did not permit it. She is stuck with me. She motioned for us to sit on the cane armchairs. The doctor said my blood pressure was exceptionally high. What does he expect? My life has been unsettled in recent years. Another barb. Everyone chooses their path in life, Mama. I couldn't let that one go, no matter how much her face had dissolved. She tried to raise her eyebrows, but only the right one responded. She was surprised at my audacity, I could tell. I held out my hand to help her to a chair, but she wouldn't take it. She preferred to limp on her head. I sat opposite her, nervous as hell. Mama had always unnerved me. When I was in primary school, the journey home from school at the end of term was torture. I counted each step to make it take as long as possible, knowing that I had Mama to contend with. She would usher me into the house as if I was a visitor and ask me to kneel half an arm's length away so she wouldn't have to stretch if the need arose for her to slap me. After half an hour of waiting for her to digest every number and analyze every word written in my report, she would fold it up and look at me intensely. The words that followed tore me apart. Because there was maybe one subject I hadn't topped the class in, Mama would look at me over her glasses and tell me I wasn't her child. My child comes first in everything she'd say, because I didn't raise a dollard. The one time that I protested that I had at least come first in everything else, she dug her nails into the back of my ears and twisted my earlobes until they burned. After that, she sat me down and asked me to write her a letter explaining why I had failed to beat the boy whose father was English in English literature. Both ears burning, I tried to work out what to write, given she'd insisted that the only acceptable explanation was that the boy had two heads. While waiting for my letter, she moved on to Lara and whipped her for her consistent all-round failure. Then she would ask why Lara couldn't be more like me. Lara soon learned to doctor her report cards. I never had the guts. I was a long sufferer. I wanted to be perfect for Mama. It was on nights like those that I prayed for my father to return home early, but it was as if he knew what awaited him. When he did return, after midnight, he would be too drunk to save us from Mama's madness. Before Mama flopped onto the cushions on the cane armchair, she did what looked like a jig. Left turn, foot forward, arms akimbo, arms down, flop. The cushions broke her fall and she patted them in gratitude. They were the same ones she'd made for her New Year ritual in 1992, nine years before. I was 16 and well into my first year of lifelessness. Mama liked to change at least one thing in our home. She said a new year wasn't truly new unless you made it new by buying a new water jug or new curtains. Every Christmas, she troubled my father for money and he always gave in in the end. That year, however, my father had spent all his money replenishing his supply of gin. We all saw the cartons in the hallway, but Mama kept asking all the same. On the 23rd of December, Mama dragged me and Lara around Dube Market and begged every fabric seller to pity her and her children by giving us their offcuts for Christmas dresses. Mama had instructed us not to wear shoes and to put on the shabbiest dresses we had. Lara almost died of shame and kept saying she needed the toilet. It didn't bother me at all because my dress reflected the way I felt. My tattered hemming captured my innermost feelings accurately. I stood by Mama, and together we trolled the entire market, until at last we bundled the rags onto our laps and took a taxi home. From the moment we opened the front door, Mama decided she wasn't sleeping and neither were we. She made us cut along her unsteady lines with a rusty pair of scissors while she carefully threaded the old sewing machine she dragged out of storage. And while she swayed over the needle, she told us to stand behind her and watch while she taught up ridiculous chores to send us on. One by one, she sewed the pieces of silk to the taffeta, the polyester to the wool, the cotton to the velvet, until she plumped eight patchwork cushions and set them into their cane frames. Lara, who at thought was slumbering on her feet, burst into tears. She was always better at expressing herself. I just stood there, praying for my father to come home and wipe that smug look off Mama's face. He swaggered in at 1 a.m. He didn't look drunk, just mellow. So mellow that he patted my head without asking why I was up so late. He had a soft smile on his face, and his eyes had a glossy film. Won't you sit down? Mama pointed at one of the armchairs. Baba noticed the difference right away, but still, he settled himself in his seat without commenting on the shambles Mama had turned our living room into. The cushions look, uh, very interesting. 
interesting, I thought. Not enchanting, provocative, affecting, alluring, striking, arresting, captivating, intriguing, enthralling, entrancing, or riveting. What was interesting was that for someone who loved words, interesting was the best he could come up with. I will never be able to bring my friends home again, Lara yelled, startling everyone. I just stood there listening to my father, humming happily to himself. Mama rolled her head back. I couldn't tell if she was hiding tears or resting. You could never tell with Mama. The okra smells as if it is cooked. Won't you help your poor mother? Or have you come to rejoice over my misfortune? Her voice returned me to the present. I dashed to the kitchen before she finished, so her words hit the back of my head and fell to the floor. It wouldn't surprise me if she were making hideous faces behind my back so she could feel a sense of victory. Mm. She exhaled as I returned to my seat. Maybe God has decided that it is time to relieve me of my sadness. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The song oozed from her lopsided mouth. It lacked melody and sincerity. She'd never been a churchgoer. Mama used God at her own convenience. God wouldn't take you without letting you see your children's children. That's what all mothers pray for, isn't it? It was all I could think to say. Oh, really? Tell me, is it the one from that buffoon you call a husband that I should look forward to? Because if it is those ones you speak of, I pray that God keeps them in his bosom. All the air inside me escaped through my mouth. How could you expect me to look forward to such grandchildren? Have you never paused to wonder how my heart stopped when you brought a married man to visit me? Or how long the dagger he dipped into my throat was when he told us that you had been courting for months? Under my roof, Polanle, under my roof, my house was burning and I didn't smell the smoke. I should have told you earlier, Mama. I didn't want to upset her. I thought, given her illness, she might be inspired to forgive me. And now your sister has followed the path you opened for her. What is left for me to live for? You know, I want God to take me so I can look him in the eye and ask why he gave me such wicked children. Mama, I don't want to quarrel. Even if we lie to each other every week, there will come a day when we must speak the truth. Bolali, you are the biggest disappointment the world has seen. You are ruined, damaged, destroyed. This time she aimed well. She hit me in a soft spot. So painful was it that I raised my palms to my face and pressed out tears like pus from a wound. She hadn't finished yet. She stopped to catch her breath and continued. Has it been so hard for you and your sister to honor me? All I wanted was for you both to do well. But no, you want your mother to die of sadness. Let me tell you, Bolanli, I don't just sit here. I beg God daily to forgive my sins, even though I don't know what they could be. I have asked myself a million times, what evil sins have I committed to bring curses upon myself? But hear this, a child who says her mother will not have rest will also be ravaged by insomnia. There is a punishment for wickedness and we will all stand before our maker one day. Mama leaned her head back into the headrest. My tears pleased her enormously. And now she cries. She cries, but she doesn't think to redeem herself. She cries, but she will return to her copulation. Of what use are such tears when, Mama, stop. Please stop. Stop what? Does the truth deafen your ears? I know I failed you, but there's so much you don't know. The truth has never said that it should not be uttered. Hear the truth now and repent. Reward your mother for all the hard work she did for you. Other than that, there is nothing more to know. The chipped skirting board caught my eye. There was a crack in the wall above it, and a row of ants headed towards a piece of bread lying by the fridge door. I held on to the frame of the cane chair. The stuffing from the cushions brushed against the back of my hand. I was raped, Mama. Did you know that? I was raped when I was 15 years old. I'd never shouted at my mother, but I heard a strident tone I'd never dared to use before. Raped? <laughs> this is not a time to tell wicked lies. Such a thing could not have happened to my child. I took a moment to collect myself, knowing she was watching me, daring me to talk without first retracting my words. You are right, Mama. I am ruined, damaged, destroyed. 
I am all those things you said. My life was wrecked, and I didn't know how to fix it. I still don't know. <laughs> no. She jerked her head from side to side. Her voice fizzled into a whisper. You couldn't have been raped. No daughter of mine could have been raped. That is not the way I brought you up. No one brings their daughter up to be raped. I closed my eyes and told her what happened. There was no point sparing her the details. It was time she heard them. When I reached the part where the stranger put the pillow over my head, Mama snatched her scarf from her head and began to rock slowly on her seat. I didn't stop. I wanted my mother to hear it all. I didn't want to carry it alone anymore. Tear after tear rolled down one eye alone. Why didn't you tell me so I could seek out this beast and cut out his insides? I wanted to be your perfect daughter. I didn't want to disappoint you. I didn't want you to hate me. Hush, child. What mother can hate the child she labored to bring into the world? Ah! The blood that runs through my veins is full of sorrow. She paused to wipe her tears with her wrapper. Was I so distant? Was I so deaf? Ah! This world and its violent surprises. It wasn't the time to answer those questions. I wasn't going to give her the chance to justify her behavior. I wanted to tell her about me. Mama, you were living with an empty shell. Everything was scraped out of me. I was inside out. Is that why you allowed yourself to be seduced by that buffoon? Distraught though she was, Mama couldn't cast aside her anger over my marriage. I didn't expect her to. It wasn't her style. She had to win. I wasn't seduced. That buffoon was prepared to take me as I was. He didn't ask me any questions. Neither did he know a past he could compare my present with. I was lost and didn't want to do anything with my life. He was satisfied with who I was. All he wanted was for me to be his wife. Imagine how appealing that was to me. Apart from the business with Shego and the abortion, which was best not mentioned, I told her everything. I told her about the wives and the rodent skull. I told her I was seeing a doctor because I hadn't been able to conceive. Mama listened and nodded her head, all the time observing my face, the tiny crow's feet at the corner of my eyes, the shallow creases on the skin around my mouth. When I had finished, she asked me if I was hungry. She looked more sympathetic than I'd ever seen her, but even so, the words I told you so were written all over her face. Only a fool would have expected reparation. Mama didn't do things that way. Before I left, I soaked all the dirty laundry. I made some ever, and when I sat down to dish out the food into separate bowls, Mama insisted that we eat out of the same one. When I returned to the sitting room after washing the dirty dishes, Mama was snoring quietly, so I looked into my old bedroom. It was a complete mess. Why did I expect different? I wasn't there to clean up after Lara anymore. The cardboard boxes in which I'd carefully folded my old clothes had been ripped open. Some of the contents were strewn around the room, others stuffed back in. She'd given the beautiful women on the Mills and Boone novels moustaches. One of my old diaries lay under the bed. Lara would have pushed it there. Perhaps she did that so Mama wouldn't find it. It was carelessly hidden all the same. Thank goodness I'd given the people in it the names of trees. I picked it up and put it in my bag. I'd throw it in the bin on my way out. Before I left, Mama gave me a firm one-arm embrace. It was awkward because I couldn't remember when she had ever held me with tenderness. There always seemed to be pain involved when she touched me, so the feel of her arm on my back, the warmth of her cheek against mine, was memorable in its own way. When I returned to Baba Segi's house that evening, I noted that it was that lovely phase of dusk when the sky filled with orange clouds, as if a paintbrush had been rinsed in it. There was a looseness about my stride. At university, my friends had joked that I walked upright to curb the tiniest provocative waggle. It's true. I sucked my buttocks in and clinched my knees together, but for a different reason. I reasoned that if I strengthened my thigh muscles, it would make it difficult for anyone to force my legs apart like they did in my dreams. That evening, I let my arms dangle at my sides. I set my hips free and my neck sought the source of every sound, the way children did until their mothers slapped the backs of their heads into the direction they were going in. I saw the night guard approaching and greeted him before he got to me. He smiled, but it disappeared all too quickly and a scrawny hand scratched a bald head. He was probably baffled by my lack of poise. I was normally so well pulled together. 
The aroma of fresh palm wine was rich and intoxicating, so I looked in the direction of the nearby shack. I wanted to see the large pregnant gourd buzzing with the hum of inebriated flies as young men dipped into it, drowning themselves in its sweetness. Leaning and slouching over them were women who braved neighborhood gossip to be there. They sat there in the distance, laughing and sipping from halved calabashes. I smiled to myself and hurried on, tickled by the playful finger of young love. I heard the footsteps gaining on me, but I ignored them. I didn't want to turn and find it was just some poor woman rushing home, clutching a Bible and a toddler. Apart from that, I was determined not to let anything knock me off my high. I hadn't felt such liberty in a long time. It was only when a voice breathlessly shouted, Wait, please, that I swung round. Good evening, Segi. She slowed down before she reached me, urging me to stop. Auntie, please, please don't tell. Mama will kill me. I exhaled. My exhilaration vanished and a sense of weariness came over me. Not more household intrigue. Could I bear it? Don't tell her what. Don't tell my mother that you saw me at the palm wine shed. Don't tell my father you saw me with a boy. <laughs> Segi flung her fingers into the air as if to shake wetness from them. She was hopping from foot to foot and her mouth was open in supplication. My heart went out to her. I won't say a word. I must have given in too easily. Either that or she just didn't believe me. Please, Auntie Bolanle, please. I beg you, Auntie, I'll do anything. <laughs> so now you want to bribe me? I asked. It occurred to me that although Segi had always been civil, she had never addressed me as auntie before. She'd always just blurted out whatever she had to say. And now, this reign of affectionate aunties. No, I'm not trying to bribe you. I'm begging you, auntie. Don't make my father disown me, please. Maybe some other person would have derived joy from seeing her so distraught, but I didn't. Neither, contrary to the young girl's thinking, did I feel I now had a punch I could pull at will? I felt sorry for her. Only seven years before, I did everything to get to Shegun's room so I could satisfy the mysterious rush of blood to my groin. I give you my word, I won't tell anyone. Segi looked up at me and wiped away tears that had not yet dropped to her cheeks. Thank you, auntie. It was a silly mistake. I've never been there before, but this boy has taken over my mind. When I sit down, I think of him. When I eat, he's there on my mind. Sometimes I fear mama will look at me and read my innermost thoughts. Mm, what's his name? Goki. He is 18. He's a student at Ibadan Polytechnic, studying to become a surveyor. She wanted me to be impressed. I indulged her. Really? Where did you meet him? His mother sells snacks outside our school. Sometimes he comes to help her. Is he handsome? Well, you saw him, didn't you? All the girls in my class are jealous of me. He didn't look bad at all. I was now too far gone to admit that I hadn't seen Segi, nor the man she was with. But why did he invite you to the palm wine shack? Doesn't he know how old you are? I told him I didn't want to go there, but he said he wanted to show me off to his friends. Did you enjoy being there? Not particularly. His friends were telling very dirty jokes. I was just happy to be near him so I could look at his face. <laughs> and have you looked at more than his face? Auntie! Segi covered her eyes with her fingers. I swear I have not seen any more. He said he would teach me how to kiss like a woman tonight, but I left him and ran after you. I'm sure all his friends are laughing at me now. She sighed and looked over her shoulder. Then they are foolish. Anyone who laughs at you for showing your family respect is a fool. How would you be feeling now if you had just sat there? My heart would be in my mouth. I wouldn't have been able to relax. Segi put her arm through mine as the thought created new dread in her mind. Good. So even though you left him at the shack, you have peace of mind. Which means you did the right thing. A real woman must always do the things she wants to do and in her own time too. You must never allow yourself to be rushed into doing things you're not ready for. We stepped onto the veranda of Baba Segi's house together, the same foot at the same time. Iyatope was the only adult in the sitting room. As soon as we strolled in, her nostrils flared like damp shorts on the washing line. She opened her mouth to speak, but no words came out. She just stared, forgetting to blink, then blinking in a flurry. She turned to the children happily scoffing their food, but it was clear that her mind was burdened. Segi touched the foreheads of each sibling she encountered. Most of them were sucking on chicken bones, their cheeks dotted with half grains of jollof rice. 
Aki looked up at us, smiled, and returned to the sports column of yesterday's newspaper. Ever since Babasegi tried to strangle me, he flattened himself behind curtains and cupboards whenever I walked by. What sort of things were you talking about? Segi asked as we walked through the corridor to my bedroom. Ordinarily, Segi would have gone straight to her mother's bedroom and then to the bedroom she shared with Aki to change her clothes. But on this occasion, she didn't do either. She linked her arm to mine, determined not to leave my side. The bedroom was as I had left it, except there was a cream-coloured bowl on the dressing table. The handle on the lid was a puckered rosebud. Oh, Iafemi has saved me some birthday chicken. I fanned the aroma towards Segi with the lid and replaced it. Well, aren't you going to eat it? Without waiting for the go-ahead, Segi dipped her fingers into the bowl and lifted out a peppered wing cut deep into the shoulder. A generous chunk of flesh, half covered by dimpled skin, hung from it. Segi placed a palm underneath to catch the oil and sank her teeth into it. She closed her eyes so she could savor the stock trickling down her throat. I just had dinner with my mother. You eat it. It's chicken and I've never been a foul person. I surrendered the entire bowl to Segi's eager hands. There are three big pieces here. I could comfortably throw the lot into one nostril. I'll finish it for you and lick the bowl. If only I'd known you were this generous. Segi spluttered with her mouthful. You can have them all, I laughed. You were saying earlier not to rush things? I watched Segi wolf down the chicken. She didn't appear to chew at all. For someone who rarely spoke to me or sat with me, I was amused by Segi's disregard for protocol. I wondered if she'd be as friendly when her mother was around. As if Iasegi had heard my thoughts, her voice suddenly rang through the walls. She inquired if Segi was back from her walk and Femi informed her that Segi was in my room. Eager to get to the bottom of the unfathomable intercourse, Iasegi went to the mouth of the corridor and yelled her daughter's name. I'd better go now, Segi said, steeping each finger into her mouth and swiveling her tongue around it. I passed her a paper napkin. Please say thank you to Iafemi for me and give this birthday present to Collie. I handed her the colorfully wrapped box and flopped onto the bed. I arched my back and tried to find sleep, but I couldn't. My mother's face kept appearing before my eyes. Besides, the silence was unsettling. There was a backdrop, a long whistle somewhere beyond my window, beyond the garden and the fence. <laughs>